I had $375 to start it off with. Think about 2020, we grossed close to 500 million. What do you think are the top three things that got your business from zero to 500 million? Relentlessness, relentlessness, relentlessness. I never thought I'm gonna be in, you know, in touch with the Kardashians many times when I was working with them. I never thought I'll be in their home. They see you, they recognize you. Hey, what's going on? It's like, what? It's like, how the hell? I'm just a schmuck coming from there. Right? The problem starts with things that are important, just not important enough. The teacher asks, does any one of you make money online or you have any business now? I logged into my Google Ads account and I showed her, she looked back and she said, this is like 180,000 a year. No, those are my little stuff because <laughs> I do have a liquidation business and that is the real money. So I remember when I walked out of the class, a bunch of kids came to me, like, what the fuck are you, man? All right, guys, welcome to episode 10 of the Miami Injury Lawyer podcast. We've got Yosef Maltin on the episode today. And he's gonna talk about how he sold his company for 500 million and how you can apply his lessons to hopefully your business. So let's get right into it. First things first, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. And let's just talk about it, man. Who are you? Who is Joseph sure. Maltin? Sure. Tell us. Uh, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm the founder of Boxytram. Okay. Uh, prior to that, I had another company called Merchandise Liquidators. Okay. But before that, uh, I'm an Israeli. I came down here after the military service in uh, two uh, I was I was about 23 when I came here now I'm 46 so I've been here half of my life yeah and I planned on just coming doing my bachelor in business and go back to Israel while I came down here you know you start putting roots in the ground and I started my first company when I was at the Broward Community College at the time wow uh, yeah so that was my first uh run as an entrepreneur, and uh, I had $375 to start it off with. I called the company Merchandise Liquidators. I spelled merchandise with a Z. It was a typo. Didn't even pay attention to it. I'm like, I, I'm so lucky getting that domain. I'm a, then you find out, oh, damn, I put it with a Z. But when I wanted to buy the one with S, it was taken. They wanted $2,000. I didn't have it. So, oh, shit. But that's how it all started. Eventually, the company turned into about $10 million, uh, a year in sales. Wow. And, um, and this is 23 years ago, so about 2001, 2002. Well, it took, it, it took it a couple of years to get to that. Yeah. Right? But yeah, 23 years ago, I came to America, but I wasn't, uh, I didn't start day one. Oh, let's course, start a company. Yeah, I'm yeah. here. How many hours I'm here? Oh, let's yeah. start a company. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do that one. It took me a minute, right? But uh, actually, the way I started this, yeah. I guess that, that was my biggest journey in life because, and when I said the biggest, in terms of time, I was looking for something so I can turn profit. How do you make money? How do you obtain a point that you can actually make money? And you walk around with no what, mm -hmm. right? I, I was, I've noticed people in school coming with fancy cars and America is really all about flashing. It takes a minute to understand that most of it is on credit or, or it's not their real money. They didn't really make it, but, but some do, you know, you don't know who did it and who didn't, right? right. And, um, and you ask, okay, all this money around here, how come I'm not, what, what do I need to do to, get, to come to a point that I can have the opportunity to start? You know, when, and it, it takes you a while. I mean, it's not like you find your what, what is gonna be my, my niche. Right. But you don't have a what because you don't have any skills. You don't have the what because you have no experience in nothing to give you perspective of what can work. Until I found um, one opportunity that really did uh, change my life. And I just doubled down. And as soon as I saw the opportunity, I understood the skills I needed. Mm -hmm. That was in the first company, Merchandise Liquidators. Right. Um, and to break it down a little bit, it's selling excess inventory from Macy's, uh, at the time Sears, you know, if you remember, <laughs> Walmart, all those major uh, chain stores, they have a liquidation program for anything they have left over or customer return. Okay. So I got this tip that, hey, listen, you can sell surplus merchandise, wholesale uh, liquidation and so on. Those are the keywords you have to go for. And you got to do search engine optimization. We're talking 2003, 2004. And so I have to figure out what is SEO. And then... What, was Google out? at Google was out at the time. Oh, no. Google was no. there. And no, no, yeah, it was. Yeah. It was. But okay. I mean, it was nothing as competitive as of it course. is now. It was also not personalized. Uh, I mean, there were evolutions in Google, but at the time when you make a position in one word, yeah. I remember when I hit the, the term liquidators on Google, 
I was globally number one. So it made no yeah. sense. Liquidators in Japan, like whatever you Google, it's going to be mine. Wow. So the traffic was insane. And you start your first business while you're an international student. Yeah. And you start making money. Um, and, you know, you, you go through a journey as an entrepreneur to understand what, what helps you, what do you really need to do. And you, you don't even think about the fact you have to stay focused on what's important and yeah. urgent. So at first you make many mistakes, but eventually you change the exploratory matter that you run your business. You try a bunch of stuff because you, you don't know. Yeah. You need to wait, wait, wait. How big can I take this to if I focus on this? You can take it to that size. Okay, let's get there. Mm -hmm. and then try other interesting stuff and you get more focus and you really grow and you can see the, the growth chart in the company like, and I can look at the years and I can tell you not focus, not focus, not focus, 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 focus. And, and once you get that mindset, yeah, you forever change. Right. And you start scaling up and then eventually I ran through the opportunity to start a subscription box, a beauty subscription box. Yeah. It was in 2012 when I heard about the opportunity. What, did you still have merchandise liquidators at the time? I ran it all the way to 2016. I owned okay. it until 20, at the end of, uh, right before Christmas, the weekend before Christmas in 2016, I exit that company and I got the wire. Amazing. Yeah. And, and if uh, you don't mind, if we can backtrack a little, merchandise liquidators, you're buying excess merchandise, yes. right? From Macy's, Sears, these big box stores. Who are you selling it to? Uh, so let me explain to the reverse logistic okay. industry. So the way it works is you go to a, a chain store. They have two things. One is they have customer return or they have leftover on the shelf, right? Okay. Based on the program they have with the vendors, with the, with the brands that sells it to them, some goes back to the vendor, some needs to be liquidated. And in order to liquidate, they have to sell it to jobbers, other wholesalers. That was me. Uh, we get listing every day of what they have available and based on what you want, you pick it. When I started, I had a couple hundred bucks. So obviously I had no money to buy any merchandise. Now I'm getting listing of lots of truckloads and more than, not just truckloads, but pallets, skids, full of, a lot of merchandise. Right. Right. And I had a website that put the information on the website and I would get phone calls and I would just educate, educate you about what it is and what's the condition and if you want to buy it. And I would tell you more or less what the deal is and you're supposed to buy it for pennies on the dollar. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's how you start off. So you flip the merchandise at first. So you were going direct to consumer initially. No, it wasn't a D2C. Oh. It was a B2B. Oh, it was, it was still B2B. It was business to business. Gotcha. I'm selling it to people that sells online, people that Got sells it. in flea markets, people that was selling. Uh, think of if you look, I'll give you a perfect example. If you look at TJ Maxx or when you look at Ross, okay. right? You walk in, you see that type of merchandise because when you walk in there, you know there are brands, but not everything you see is a brand name. Correct. But what you will see is a rock that says, say it's all button down shirts for men. So you're going to see the sizes on, on the rock. So you, you get there and you kind of like understand what it's all about. And he said, say you're size 32. I have no idea what sizes are for shirts, but let's just say 32. Yeah. You come in like, okay, that's my size. You see from 30, uh, 32, this is my section. This is all I can find in that button down shirt. That's it. Yeah. This is the style of stores that would buy from me because I would Got educate it. them. Look, this is how you sell these goods in a physical place. And the ones that are odd sizes, like extra, 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 extra large and all those, they were fantastic for online vendors. So I would explain this to them. I said, open an online store for this because that's where the odd sizes, the petite size, the big and tall, all those would go. And or even um, a maternity clothes would Got be it. amazing online. But physical place, it's so specific, it's not selling very well. So you might want to go and take the, the, re the other sizes for your area. You'll eventually figure it out. So kind of like, so, you know, it was, it was an education for me how to sell the merchandise. What is it? And uh, what are the deals and how to really scale a business? That was my boot camp for school. Yeah. I was going to business school, but they taught me nothing about business. Yeah. Literally nothing. Um, I mean, they did, but nothing helpful, nothing important, nothing urgent, nothing that you need to start off. But it was definitely, um, the business that taught me the business. Of right? course. Yeah, in time. And yeah. What, the urge to want to make it bigger. Correct. And was there a point in time where you were in business school and you were running this business and like was the business successful while you were in school? Yeah. And you're sitting in class and I'm like, I make more money than these professors. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I had I had a funny moment where at the time I was about to finish my, my degree. It was international um, I think it was international finance. 
and the teacher asked, does any one of you make um, money on, online or you have any business? Now, at that time, I had the liquidation business. And I also noticed I'm doing so well with SEO, so I started doing a bunch of affiliate websites and you name it. I had casino sites, uh, affiliate, not my own affiliate casino. Yeah. I, had, I had a lot of money coming from affiliate uh, programs. And I remember that I, you know, I raised my hands with two other people and they spoke first. One person said he made $5,000 last year and he showed how and something, someone else did something similar. Then she came to me. And at that time, I was roughly making about 20000 a month from all kind of affiliate programs. It wasn't even the liquidation. Yeah. It was just Google Ads and all that. And I logged into my Google Ads account and I showed her day by day what I'm making over there. And you can see by the, by the month, by the year. And I, she, she logged, we logged in and I showed it to her and she said, wait a minute, what is Google AdSense? I said, well, you know, you have a website, you get traffic, you just put those, this code and it, it generates ads related to your content. And when people click on it, there's a, there's a revenue share between you and Google. She's like, okay, and what, what it, so I told her, well, you see over here, I make roughly about 500 bucks a day, which is 15,000 a month. She said, yeah, but from what time to what time do you work? I'm like, no, it's 24 hours, it's the internet. It's not, I don't do any, how much do you pay for that? No, no, I'm not paying anything. This is the organic, <laughs> they're paying me. And she said, wait, so you're making, so she looked back and she's like, this is like 150,000, this is like 180,000 a year said, yeah, but that's just on Google Ads. Let me log into my casino site, and then I have another one that sells other stuff on Overstock. That I showed her that and said, why, so you're making all that? I said, no, those are my little stuff, because <laughs> I do have a liquidation business, and that is the real money. So I remember when I walked out of the, the class, yeah. a bunch of kids came to me. I don't, I'm saying kids, but it's not. Yeah. It's students. I said, what the fuck are you, man? What can we do to make money? It was, it was yeah. first time that it hit me that this is not an obvious thing you know? right and uh, and wow. but, but she did ask me how much money did you start with yeah and i told her 375 dollars yeah and it was that was one of the aha moment and, and after that it was it was fun because professors wanted to talk to me and ask me questions yeah it was nice were, were there any professors that uh like treated you badly or, or, or nah. rude to you after that maybe jealous never or, never, or no never. they were no. all they were all impressed they wanted to learn more and Listen, I'm not sure about story. the professors today. Yeah. I know that back then, no one was radicalized against people that actually know how to make money. Right. Right? No one was trying to go and hate you and tell you, hey, you make money, for sure you're, you're a thief. For sure you stole from people. Yeah. Right? It didn't exist <laughs> yeah. at the time. Yeah. No one was radicalized yet. Yeah. Um, if we only knew. But uh, right. no, it was, it was all good. People that's were, awesome. Yeah. That's, that, that's incredible. Um, and then I'm sure it inspired other students as well, tremendously. Mostly after, because that was just yeah. a one time and a couple of people. But, but after, um, when I exit BoxyCharm, yeah. uh, prior to that, BoxyCharm. Um, yeah, let's talk about BoxyCharm let's now. Talk about let's Boxy talk about BoxyCharm, yeah, so, how that started. Okay, so BoxyCharm is a monthly beauty subscription box that I built in 2013 and I exit at the end of 2020. Yeah. Um, it wow. was a box, full size makeup items, all that. I can pretty much explain to you how I got into it. Yeah. I got an order. When I had the liquidation, I was selling also makeup. So subscription boxes started buying products from me where when they couldn't find free products, the concept when I learned about this was give us stuff for free, we'll put it in our box, and we'll give it to highly engaged consumers. That was the concept for everyone. Got it. The, found, the, the founder of the idea was actually uh, Birchbox. They, they came up with the concept. And when I saw it, I started getting calls from subscription boxes and they would buy for me products. I said, wait, you want to tell me that they're not paying anything? So what if I find a way to pay the, good, the cost of goods, the manufacturing cost? and give it to the consumer that was that would basically bridge a gap because how how much how can you scale if you keep asking for free shit right what if you have someone that can figure out the economics where he can actually pay but beat you for that so anyway i found that i can do it i was able to convince people to give me their manufacturing cost but in hmm. in the beauty industry the margins are so high people don't realize the margins when you buy your product. Now it's for the right reasons. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they should cut the cost because they, they can make a huge margin and, and still lose money at the end of the year. There's just so Got much it. more other than, than the cost of goods. Of course. But when it comes down to the cost of goods, in my case, I said, hey guys, I'll just pay you the cost of goods. So if you take an eyeliner, sometimes an eyeliner can cost 15 to $20. 
but the cost of goods, at least at the time, was if you're doing it in Schwanstabilo, which is in Germany, and a very reputable uh, pencil manufacturer, it would be 60 cents. Wow. So let's give you an example of, of kind of profits. Don't yeah. So now I, I created a concept where I said, I want to create consistency on value or product. I'm going to sell the box for $21. That's how it started. You, I'll pay $10 for the cost of goods, the, the products. If I'll keep the box under a pound, I'm going to ship it for about $3 or a little bit less in opposed to $6.75 when it's over a pound. Mm -hmm. And shipping and, and fulfillment and all that, I was able to really make it efficient. The packaging, everything was pennies. So we were able to put all that into product, all the rest of the money into product, and, uh, and then st still keep some profit. Yeah. And it was all about scaling and just having more and more people. Now, in order for you to scale in that situation, the only way to scale that makes sense is get good shit. Like, you get surprise people. You have right. to surprise those ladies with the best products every fucking time. How the fuck is he staying in business? But it was, so to get down and dirty, I had to go to labs, manufacturers, understand what is the raw cost. Because cost. now I'm asking you, what is your cost? for? I have to trust you. Right. Right. Now, I don't know. In the beginning, they told me, yes, nail polish, $2.50. I paid that. Right. 30,000, 50,000 units. Wow. Later on, I found out, no, it's like 40 cents. So people bought apartments because of my com the yeah. complaints with me, right? But, but I mean, it's, it's an evolutionary part, right? Eventually, when you keep scaling and scaling, you know the cost of goods, you get familiarized, you know the manufacturers, you know what everything costs, you know what they manufacture, everything. And it really comes down to how skilled are you in the specific skill that you need in order to beat your competition. So you start acquiring skills in manufacturing, you start acquiring skills in what's trending in social media in terms of products, and then what trends are on social media to actually go viral. Right. Who are the trending influencers? You start getting friends with them. How do you ship one million boxes? At the peak, we, sell, we sold 1.2 million boxes wow. a month when we sold it. Wow. You have to assemble about 100 different variations, and it's roughly 1.2 million boxes, and you have about a week and a half to do it. So you learn that there are only few companies that are willing to even take on that type of business from you. Oh, so you were outsourcing the pack, the sending and by, the packaging? By, at the time when I was having it, yes. And then eventually we learned that you can only scale so much with someone else. Yeah. And my idea, my philosophy was Amazon wouldn't be Amazon if they, hand, if they didn't handle their logistic, mm -hmm. the fulfillment. So we, we built a facility in Kansas City. It was, it's the size of 10 football fields. Wow. Uh, to, to go and build. But at the time, we're, while we were building it, we end up selling the business, so we sold everything as a package. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Wow. So th the idea is you go to these makeup companies or whatever, cosmetic companies. Mm -hmm. You tell them, hey, give me your product at manufacturing costs. The consumer gets a taste of it, right? And then hopefully they'll buy more in the future. Was that your pitch to them? It was, it was more or less like that. I would tell yeah. you, look, in case you haven't heard about the subscription concept, we pay you the manufacturing cost. We give it to highly engaged consumers. Mm -hmm. We also give it to many influencers. We're putting it all at the same time. Think of the a biggest buzz you can imagine yeah. at one time. If, uh, let's just say 300,000 units with you. So 300,000 people are going to try your product. Right. So I want to get your best foot forward. What is the product that would best represent your box? Hmm. Your product, I'm sorry, your brand. Yeah. I'll put it in a box and I'm going to give this to consumers and many influencers. We worked at the peak or at the end when we sold it with over a thousand influencers a month, close to 2,000. Wow. And uh, what, including was that? Kylie Jenner, including, wow. but she was obviously the, the yeah. highest paid, but, but we had from small micro ones all the way to uh, large, uh, even celebrities like her. And that's it, you, you're basically gonna have a buzz. And yeah. it, did, it did make a big impact on some companies growth. Of course, Yeah, I can imagine. And was that influencer marketing done in house? as well or everything were, everything was done in everything house, was yeah. done in-house yeah. and how much were you spending on influencer marketing was that like in terms of percentages if you remember was that nothing the, i mean oh well percentage nothing. is yeah. nothing really so, yeah because i mean look in terms of your your marketing if, yeah, budget if you think about 2020 yeah. right we grossed close to 500 million in gross revenue wow. it was 470 and that's the year that you sold yeah that's the year that i sold um 
that's that's uh, so then and the year before that we did 200, 230 and before that 130 so we're really wow. doubling every year the budget didn't actually change that much with influencers it was roughly about 300,000 a month that include Kylie Jenner that include a thousand of them getting wow. boxes uh, yeah like we had and that includes a th- I want to say it also include in that cost events that we did everything combined hmm. um, you know, for 500 million. Now, we didn't really de- do paid seriously until we roughly did about 200 million in sales. So it was really coming from influencers. Yeah. Influencer spend. Um, and, uh, but, but like when you spend on influencers like that, when you have over a thousand, right? You're, first of all, you do not need a major team. I had three people in that team. That's it. That's it. Wow. It sounds like, wow, you need lots of people. And no, 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 it doesn't work like this. Second, it's just a progression that you start with like 150. Every month you stack up some more. You uh, leave some other ones because then maybe they don't post or mm-hmm. whatever. So you, you clean home and you get some more. But that's what we did. But the way I look at influencers, for the most part, I look at this as the artillery. I don't see it as selective shooting. This is, I'm giving it to a whole bunch of them. I know that this is going to be the budget and overall I need to see sale growth. I'm not looking to see each individual how much growth they brought in because in my case there was no discount code. It's just very hard to, to try. monetize it yeah. and it's like either I don't do it because there's no way to really monetize Yeah. Uh, or, or I'll do it and then just look at this as a whole. I like, did that bum do any good for us this month? Did it create enough noise? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. And eventually it was just a strategic tool to get brands to roll into our program and between getting focusing and getting the best products out there Mm -hmm. and giving it to many influencers it consistently worked i mean you you can argue that influencers are not as relevant as before and i would definitely agree but that is not important if you have a product that makes sense their job is to show it the people's job is to later on decide if they like it or not. And mm-hmm. for them to decide if they like it or not is how good the product was compared to the competition right. or so on. So, so that's, that's the focus that people should have. So it comes down to the product at the end of the day. You really got to make sure you have a great product. product. Yeah. Great product or service. Service, exactly. Right? So that was your probably your brand recognition, right, was the influencers. When it came to direct to consumer marketing, what were you focusing on? Google ads? Did you Um, go back to your roots with the Google ads? With with the Google ads, I never actually did ads. What I was talking about was Google AdSense. um, Right. That was not marketing. What I did with Google AdSense in my old life was having a page that goes on. I mean, there's no viral on Google, but it was getting good positions in Google, lots of traffic, and I would just fill it up with with Google AdSense where people clicking on them. Yeah just get uh, revenue and that was kind of like fun to build every time i would build another one and i would get more money i was like ah that's great it's like i have another apartment i'm renting over here it's a each, yeah. each uh, website and i remember i had this guy in india that would make me those websites and i was telling him look make me a dynamic website and i want you to pull the data from those other websites and then eventually i created this uh, this uh, rotating it, Imagine how you do in ChatGPT, you ask them to rephrase some things yeah. for you, right? So I had like a really shitty way to do it back then, but it was good enough for Google. So I had this supposedly original content, but not really, because it was targeting synonyms. So when you actually read it, it makes no fucking sense. Yeah. <laughs> but it would look as if it was your own, and I would just have more and more content pushed online. And then once I see traffic, I would throw the ads on them. Got it. And, uh, but Google got smarter eventually, and all those sites yeah. vanished. Rightly so, and yeah. you have to really think of real product to actually sell it. Of okay. course. So, but but going back to the question, were you doing? Uh, how are you getting direct to consumers for um, for BoxyCharm? How are you? What kind of? What other marketing were you doing? It's pretty much everything we did. I mean, we just oh, did it. paid. Got you. Later on, paid Google okay. and uh, no ads. Paid mostly ads. was less in Google. It was Got mostly it. Facebook. Oh, okay. Uh, mostly so, Facebook ads, but um, but that was at the end. And uh, got it. And what do you think, like, as I know this is a broad question, but what do you think are the top three things that got your business from zero to 500 million? Mm. Relentless. Just relentlessness, relentlessness, relentlessness to keep on doing more. The thing is, 
if you want to get from zero to 10 million, it's a, just a lot of companies can do it. If you think about the fact that one out of 35,000 companies would do 100 million or more in revenue. 100, no, 100 million dollar, you need 35,000 companies, so one of them will do 100 million or more. And how many do you need to make a million? That's one out of 10. How many you need for 10 million? It's one out of 100, hmm. right? So you say, well, one out of 100 companies, that's a lot, yeah, but you need 35,000 to 10x that. Right. It's and exponential. It's exponential. And you ask yourself, okay, so I, I made more, but how the fuck did I do that? That question keeps coming, right? I don't, I don't have all the answer for myself. Yeah. Uh, because I think that humans are complicated events. And, and also understanding a success is not a simple thing. Because to, to understand success, you go back and there's so many anecdotal parts that happen in, in, in each moment. It's easier to understand failure, but success is, is tougher. But in general, I would say relentlessness on the vision. This is where I need to be. Mm -hmm. And the second part is I'm just very competitive. My, my competition would always document. The, eventually, they bought me. How much they made? Thank you. You gave me the, I know where I can reach. I know I know, I know I have a better product. I know I'm doing better marketing. It's just a matter of time until I'm going to get there. I definitely had a lot to learn because it's not just product and marketing, administrative part, process, procedures, SOPs. It's all part of it, right? Yeah. It just, it's, it's an important part of the recipe that you need to learn later on, right? When you're small, it doesn't that matter, but later on, it's, it's very instrumental. So eventually you start, okay, what is the missing part that the business is short on? Okay, this, let's double down on this infrastructure let's do that so you you gravitate towards what's important only for now only for this mm -hmm. and focus is important and that, that was definitely helpful so you're for the second part you're almost treating it like a puzzle piece right you're looking for that next puzzle piece that you mm -hmm. can get better make take the business to the next level yeah. figure out how to fix it and then you know move on to the next thing for me it, it was important because look i did not come from uh, a background where I was around, surrounded with people who build big stuff. I, it mm -hmm. was just me and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, I could see that uh, so the competitors who uh, Ipsy bought me later on, you know, they're, they're bankers in their past. They've been around, they've been private equities and so on. So they've seen big stuff. They've been with, with people and they, they started prob much earlier on as, as a, an enterprise level business. Yeah. With us, it took us a minute. I mean, and, and it hurt us for not understanding yeah. how to scale the operation because you don't think about fast scaling. So it hits you when it moves fast. So for instance, if I tell you right now that you can go and sell those bottles and those bottles, you know, um, you can make it for a dollar, sell it for 10. So great, you buy a machine, you do this phenomenal promotion and you start pumping bottles and you start selling them. And then some mega influencer goes and says, guys, those, those are crazy good bottles. Look at this. It, it's half the price of all the other bottles, whatever. Now you get 100,000 orders, but your machine can only make 5,000 a day. Mm -hmm. So now people have to wait 20 days to get that, right? Now they're yeah. angry. Now they're trashing you on social media. Now they hate you. They demonize you. Yeah. It's like, it like, I didn't know I'm going to need so many. At first, if I, I thought if I'll send 1,000 a month, I'll be good. Now they want 100,000. So those things happen to us hmm. in different ways. And it happened more than once. And every time we had to jump uh, over a new hump, that was a challenge yeah. to grow. Like, I can, I can totally see the $10 million barrier in this space, because uh, in the subscription space. Because if you make $10 million, at that point, you have X amount of boxes. Usually, once you get more than 10, 20,000 subscribers, you need to go in and manufacture products. If you're a brand, you usually don't have on the shelf more than 10,000 units or 5,000 units. So if I want to get something to my box and have 3,000 subscribers, I go and I buy for the next two weeks what I need. But there's a moment that from now till now, you have to go and buy a year out. Why a year out? Because nobody has the quantities once you get to 10 or 20,000. Yeah. So you have to go for production. Production is at least eight months, at least. So now you got to buy for all those months in between as well. Yeah. You have to upfront the money because nobody knows you. So luckily, I had the cash because it was my side business. But a lot of companies don't. And you have to do it all at once. And you know you're going to either buy too many or not enough. Right. 
which that was, a, that was a barrier for so many, there were hundreds of them, and many of them crushed under that particular barrier, mm -hmm. and they just stayed there. Once you hump that, there are other barriers to jump, but that was the first one. Right. And were there like some key people that you brought into the business that exponentially made crazy changes? Mm -hmm. And like, how did it feel delegating and giving them the power, right? As business owners, you almost like you treat the business as your baby and you have to give up a part so of it's it It's a up. good question. It's a challenge at first because you don't know who's good. Yeah. And what happened is everyone that worked for you at first, they're very, very good in the specifics of what we're doing but many times they haven't seen something bigger. So you do need to bring a person who has seen a bigger company, a bigger organization, and, and you, you feel like you're like a chicken with their head cut off. You have to be involved in every activation and nobody uh, can take a real mature decision in a company yet and you don't know why. Mm -hmm. And when you try to bring in a person to manage the, the young crowd that you have at first that knows the job very well, those managers don't know the job so they don't get the respect. So eventually I brought in a person uh, that did a fantastic job. Uh, I, I hired him, he came from Chewy, he was a VP of merchandising and operation. And um, he came in and what I kind of wanted to see is someone who has been to a company that did between 50 to 100 million in sales and grew way past that. And that's exactly when he went to Chewy and that's when he left. He left when they did about 2 billion. He didn't leave yet, he left because I hired him. but. The exit when they did two billion in sales, but he came in when they did a hundred. Mm -hmm. So he have seen a transformation, and I needed someone who have seen a transformation like that. There aren't too many companies, right? And that was my challenge. I couldn't find a person who did a subscription box because it's just me and two other guys doing it. But something in ecom that took off involves logistics, involves right decisions. He was the, and he really understood how to take my vision and strategize underneath it and then build orga, the org underneath me with the qualified people. And he did a fantastic job. So that's when you understand the real difference between uh, kind of like a solopreneur versus a real entrepreneur that gather a team and let them kind of like shine in their domain. Right. You have to, you have to give them like the ownership almost, like you right? Have to, you have of to. their role. Because 100%. if your hand's always in it, then, you know. Well, here's the deal. If I hired you right now, I am a marketing CEO, for instance. I yeah. know marketing. You come in, you did good in the interview. I go and I tell you right now, go. The problem if I know marketing and I find out, wait a minute, Joy, I don't think you understand how this one works over here. I tell you one time, I find out very quickly that your skill set is not what I thought. Mm -hmm. I might have to hold your hand a little bit. Right. I don't just hand it over to you. Right. Right. Or oh, I might not keep you. It depends. Right. Right. Um, however, if I notice if it's a, if if it's a subject I have no knowledge about, okay, data science. I don't know. I don't. I just have to wait for the results and see. Yeah. You know. So it really, it really is a different. You cannot blame a CEO sometimes to go in and get involved. It's, right. it's kind of like a mindset, let them do their job. Yeah, I will, if I know they know their job. Right. So if I know that job, I know if right. you know your job. Right. Okay, but if you come in and I notice you don't know shit. Right. My job is not to let you do that. Oh no, of course right? not. <laughs> so, not, not to destroy everything. Yeah, yeah. so that's the... It, were there, did you try to learn, I'm, I'm assuming the answer is yes, but you try to learn a little bit about everything, about what everyone it's was my doing nature, yeah, it's to my, yeah. make sure that they were doing the right thing. Most, Yeah, well, there are two, two parts. One is if it's very instrumental and it's, it hasn't really been done before that much, how to build a beauty box, right? A be, an actual building it. How do you actually do it? Like, okay, no one did this before. Yeah. What works, what doesn't work, I got to figure it out. Yeah. All right. Then I'll train people underneath me. But if it's something like I, I need someone to be a, a, a director for logistic or fulfillment, it's been done a million years, right? So I can get people for that. I don't have to go and check. I can, I can really bring one or two people. I, I, I understand logistic because I've done shipping all my life. Yeah. And so I can sit, but overall, I don't have to get involved. When do I get involved is when there is a big problem. And believe it or not, you come in, like for instance, we had an issue that we had about 500,000 subs uh, subscribers at the time. And if, uh, I remember there was an issue, I think it was five or 600,000. And we had an issue with one of our, our box variations where 
we had a data scientist that gave everyone the wrong shade. So if you're dark skin, you get the light skin. If you're light skin, you get the dark skin. He just messed everything up. And I remember that we get about 300,000 emails and we had about 200 people to respond. Holy and every shit. time they're trying to respond, it takes them 30 minutes because we sat on a system called Veracore that if too, too many people from the customer service team is on it, it basically freezes. Hmm. So I noticed that it takes forever to go in and deal with this. And I asked, why is it taking for you guys 30 minutes? And they, said, they told me why. I said, well, I went to my engineers that were in the room. I said, can you guys do um, some MySQL database with all the information of where the boxes are and do it every, uh, refresh it every 30 minutes? This way, they would not give you, they wouldn't have to open Veracore. They can just go into our system. They said, yes. Once they did this, everyone were able to move fast. Second thing is, I said, why don't you send an email to all 300,000? Because we know that there's only one question they're asking, and this is the answer. How about you send an automatic email to everybody? You clear it out, and whoever had a different question, you just say at the bottom, if that didn't answer your question, please respond over here. And then whatever, a couple hundreds of them had actually a different question. Yeah. So that was, so you, you know, um, the point is, is to actually explain that it's okay to dive into things when it's time, even if it's not your thing, because sometimes yeah. an outside perspective is important. And listen, the, I hired nothing but super professional experienced people in this space, but they right. didn't come up with this. I had to come up and deal with that. And that's okay. And that's, that's your job to do it. And uh, ultimately your job is to understand what other people didn't understand. Right. When you run a business, at the end of the day, you're getting a phone call, say at midnight. It's usually because there is a problem that no one was able to solve and now it's your turn. Right. Right. And you better be into the minutiae to understand. You need to understand this. So when you spend your hours every day and you decide what do I want to do, don't let yourself do everything. Do only what you have to, what you have to do because no one else can do instead of you. And then when it's time to learn new material, you just got to be fast learner. Yeah. You got to be fast learner and then hopefully teach, teach others, right? Uh, hopefully. Hopefully, Hopefully yeah. you don't have to teach them. Hopefully yeah. they'll, they'll, they'll know it, but yeah. And how big was your team when you sold? How many people? Uh, so it was uh, actually not too big. I think it was about 150 W2 employees between the office here and the Canadian office. Yeah. And we had more people outside because there's a lot of temp workers. So building boxes, it wasn't our right. temp. Or if uh, customer service, it was in Dominican Republic and the Philippines. Gotcha. Uh, so okay, yeah. so you were outsourcing back then too, huh? yeah, like no, to absolutely. other countries. Yeah, I mean, customer yeah. customer service definitely was. It's everybody outsource it. It's yeah. just very very good. But it's your employees. I mean, I visited yeah. so many times the people in both in both places. I went to really? the Philippines many times. I don't remember how many times to visit them, go meet with them, drink with them. We had a couple hundreds of them. Wow, amazing! Yeah, yeah just when you run a team, you you got to think about the fact that. Even if it's a remote team, you visiting them and saying hi to them, it's probably something that 1% of the, of the vendors are doing over there. You meet them and all their friends work in, in the same customer service center. Yeah. They'll do PayPal, they'll do everybody. No one ever come to visit them. You're the only one that they see a face behind this. What do you think is going to be more motivated? Who do you think is going to be more of motivated? Course. Someone who doesn't even know what their boss looks like? Yeah. Or someone that knows you and, you know. That's uh, it's different. Yeah. Makes them give a shit about your company. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And where do you think you got these leadership skills from? Were they from the Israeli military? Were they mm. from, did you read a lot? Did you study other people? In time, you learn things. Yeah. I feel like, you know, in, in terms of leadership, proficiency really does play a bigger role than people think. There is a, there's a big, look, if, if I know how to solve problems, Let's just say I'm not, I don't have a deep voice. Let's just say I'm physically looking uncharismatic. Let, give me all those stuff. But you look at me anyway, you want to look at me. But after a while, when you stick around and you work with me and you find out, shit, let me tell you something. No one knows this better than him. You come over, there's a problem. You know that there's only one person at the end of the, of the hole that can actually fix it. Yeah. That would, so when you say something, People quiet are quiet because they know you know your shit. Right. By itself, this is probably the most important, in my opinion, attribute for leadership. Uh, because all the other things can be trained and taught. 
You can absolutely, I can go and teach you how to speak in non-monotonic voice, certain postures, how you stand with people, deeper voice, you name it. There, you can go on Google and, and, or ChatGPT and they'll give you 20 things, but longevity right. for leadership, other than the obvious stuff that I can always teach you how to speak to people, and it really comes down to know your shit better. Know your product, know your yeah. company, know your shit. You have to be good be at the what problem you do. Solver. You can get around a lot of things. Yeah. Look, in, in leadership, it's not an exact science. So I can see something that you are not, and you, I'm going to see value in this, and you're not, and, right. and so on. And we can both be right or wrong. But ultimately, because it's not an exact science, some things that might be considered taboo, you can never do it as a leader. Some great leaders will still do it. And yeah. you can say, yeah, but they're the abnormality. No, it, it's not about that. It really comes down to kind of like a weight between, between characters. If I sit down in a room and I am respectful and I listen to everybody and I want to be, I, I let everyone talk, then I'll say my piece and all that stuff, right? But at the end of the day, I can never make my own decision. And when I make a decision, it usually is wrong. It doesn't matter how respectful and people are going are to piss on you. Yeah. I'll if I know much. my shit and I, I cut you off because as soon as you start talking, I know what you're going to say and then I'll, nah, it's not going to work and I cut you off and it might sound rude and everything else. If they know I know my shit, right. it's going to be okay. It's yeah. going to pass with no problem. But right. if I don't know my shit, Oh, that would be even worse, right? Right. At, at least shut the fuck up and listen. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So it's it's not all made equal. So I say, know your shit. If you yeah, will, if it, uh, it's a mix of yeah. things. And were there certain mentors that you had along the way? Like, I my my business is hopefully going to be close to to eight figures soon. It's amazing. Yeah, I'm still at the seven yes. multiple. Thank you, multiple seven figure mark. But taking a business to nine figures, yeah. you know, I can't imagine how much you have to know, how much you have to learn, were there certain mentors that you had that you would now, reach out to? I'll ask you a question. Do you have competitors that are doing far greater? It's exactly like you, right. accident lawyers that took it to a whole different level. Yeah. Now that's going to be a good mentor. Right. They don't need to know they're your mentor. Of course. My competitors in my first business, okay, we're always friends. Yeah. We're still friends. If I tell you that those were my mentors. Did they know they're my mentors? No. I was looking at my competition. Sometimes we're talking, sometimes we don't even know each other, but I'm looking at what they're doing and I have a path for growth. I look at what they're doing. This is a mentor. Hmm. So in my case, I can tell you my competition was my best mentor. Yeah. Either knowingly or not knowingly. Right. Um, and then ultimately I did not sit, like I said, in a table dinner as a kid with really successful. No, I wasn't. Yeah. Uh, now, obviously, I have a lot of friends that are well off and they, they did amazing. But yeah. um, before you get into that, uh, I would say to that club where people open doors for you and everything else, it's like, it's just you, you go with what you go, you, you go with what you see who is doing better than you. And that was always my thing. Like my bigger driver and motivation saying, okay, if my competi if I'm doing a dollar and my competition does five dollar, okay, I gotta get there. Yeah. See what he's doing. Okay, what do I have better? Okay, I have maybe better marketing, but not this. What do they have that contract? I don't have this one. But at least you you isolate it to something digestible that's very specific that now you can tackle. Mm -hmm. And now that was that that would be a, the best piece that, because it's so specific, it's easier to use that as a better case study, and that would be a better mentor versus a generalist that's going to come, some billionaires who made money 20 years before me, before I was in this world, and uh, he would go and tell me how he needs to think about stuff. Don't, don't get me wrong, it definitely has some weight. Yeah. But what can be better than the guy who does exactly what you're doing? Yeah. Just doing it better. Right. This is the best. I, liked, I really like that answer. I'm friends with a lot of my competition. Yeah. Um, some of the largest law firms, I, I don't know them personally, the owners yet, but law firms that are doing it a little bit better than me, I'm friends with them and I talk to them. And I think I agree that you should always you know, talk to your competition, yeah. learn from them. I think a lot of people try to avoid their competition you know, and they're like, oh, I'm not going to be friends with him. He does what I do. Yeah. Me, I'm, I'm the opposite. I'm like, fuck that. I and by learn the way, it's, it's like. not... It's not wrong or right, right? It's right. just um, you don't even have to be their friends for them to know of that course. there are competitions, right? Yeah. Um, sometimes I, f I like to keep a distance with some competitors because I know that once I meet the person, that's it. I'm going to be 
taking some air out of that balloon, yeah. trying to compete because now we're friends. Like, shit, I can't mm. go on the gray side. Mm. And, <laughs> so, and as if there's the black, I never go there on the, on yeah. the dark, dark side. But on the gray side, you yeah. know, let me poke a little bit the bear. Yeah. But now when we're friends, I can't do that. So, yeah. so I, I purposely kept it away gotcha. from some of them, yeah. Gotcha. And then uh, going back to BoxyCharm and the sale, how does what are the logistics of selling a company for five hundred million dollars, mm. and how do you exit a company? Yeah, so you go through a process with investment bankers. So first, you okay. want to um, you want to identify the right investment banker. You interview a whole bunch of them. You kind of send them a teaser. You go to Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase. You go to Deloitte. You go to all of them. You give them teasers, right? And then they, there's a day where you do a bunch of desk side meetings and they pitch you why they're the best gotcha. to, do the job, to do the job. And they come with a deck, they give you a little deck that tells you, other than sucking your dick and tell you how great you are and wow, <laughs> you're amazing and all that, you literally get from them a deck of what's the positioning in market and what are the acquisitions and so on. What's really important is to ask yourself, have they done acquisitions in that space when they say, well, we're not involved in any of those. That means you probably don't sit on the M&A meetings with the potential buyers every month. Right? In my space, it was the beauty industry, so Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley. They sit down every quarter with the M&A team from L'Oreal, from Sashedo, from Lauder, from whoever else, uh, big uh, uh, sponsors, which it can be like GA, uh, General Atlantic, a big private equity firm. So they do those meetings and they know the buyers, they know their names, and they already have meetings with them scheduled to tell them who's on the market and who's against who. So your idea is to get, it doesn't matter if you're taking, say, Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley, it's really coming down to make sure you take the one that have the connections with the potential buyers and they're sitting with them. And the second part is you have to make sure you understand how to negotiate the actual sale. So if you want to sell it for, say, 300 million would be your bottom line. OK, but you hope to get 700 because you have no idea what you're going to get. Right. Yeah. So when you talk to them, you have to understand that you're going to do this transaction with them once, maybe twice in your life if, if you're very lucky and good. Yeah. So they don't give a shit about you that much. But when they go to L'Oreal, Estee Lauder, all that, they care about them more than you. So they will tell them what is your bottom line. And that I learned from my partners because I had great partners, private equity, uh, Carl Priley, and they explained this to me. They said, listen, that's just the way it works. They're the biggest snitches. Uh, so when you, inter when you go through... The, the, the part where you do all those desk side meetings, everything will be leaked. So you can literally make a game and say, all right, to one, I'm going to say that I grossed 400. The other one, I'll say 450. The other one, I'll say 500. Just throw it. And then when it comes back to you, some say, I heard you sold 475. Ah, that was uh, Goldman Sachs. <laughs> I know mm -hmm. get that number. That's your stamp. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was one of those because mm -hmm. they are. So you have to be careful. Uh, you have to disclose what you have to disclose. And yeah. Nice. And then on the day you sell a company for five hundred million, what does that feel like? Oh man, um, nothing. That's it. Took me six months to really to, to, to digest it. It took it took me six months, and I remember the moment when it hit me. Yeah. So I bought my place um, in Fort Lauderdale, and I got separated during COVID while I'm selling the business. And um, I stayed in great relationship with my ex-wife. She's amazing. And I remember when we sold, I was sitting with her and with the Goldman Sachs lady. We got the wire. And now you see all those nine digits in your account. And she asked me, what are you feeling? The Goldman Sachs. And I was with my ex. And both of us felt nothing. I mean, for us, it was like we were the only one that knew. Like she was the, My mom didn't know. Nobody knew I'm selling the business. Only she knew. Yeah. So though we were going through divorce, you know, it, it's like something that... You can't share it with anybody. So for us, it was, uh, it was exciting. But uh, we sat down and we just didn't get excited. And I didn't know why, at least with me. Now, I kind of knew it's going to happen because it's not my first exit. And what was it, your first? How much was your first exit? Just it was a couple of millions okay, also. Gotcha. Yeah. But, but yeah, again, you don't feel shit. Yeah. And you're like, what the fuck? Now, I don't know. At the time, I kept running the business and I was running other business. So nothing happened. But in this case, 
I was supposed to stay for two years to hand over the company. It ended up three months, I want to say, or two months. That was, the buyers just Yeah, because the buyers, to... they already know the business. Gotcha. And, you know, when I came, I'm like, no, we don't do it like this. We do it like that. And they're like, no, 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 over here we do it like this. So I'm like, guys, if you're already doing it, just do it. Can I go? And they're like, no, yes, no, fine. But eventually, after six months, I made this announcement on my post that, guys, leave me alone. Don't ask me where is my box or what happened. I sold the company. I don't know. Okay, I got out of it, right? That was my, my speech. And then what happened after, after I said that, that's when it hit me. I sat down. I, I really just dropped off my kids at my ex. I bought this new house on the Isles. I was like fucking looking at the water from my plan. Like, this fucking gorgeous. I can live my life like this forever. And then it hit me. And I understood why. As soon as I said, guys, I sold the business. Leave me alone. I'm not. I mentally was detached from the business. 20 years of entrepreneurship ended with large sum of money in your bank account while they op just opened up the country and you're single. So it all hit me at once. Yeah. But it took it six months. Holy shit. And I sat down I'm like, I can't fucking believe this. This is an answer. Like I was able to sit down. And why sitting down made it like this? Because you see, when I was married, I would sit down and I felt like my ex was like, I mean, she's a woman. It's not her fault. <laughs> They're women. They, they, just, they can't see us sitting down doing nothing. So I would finish yeah. work no matter what how, uh, dragons I had to kill. Oh, I can relax. I'm sitting down. She can't see me sitting down. She was like, can you do me a favor? Can you take that tree, take out the tree from there, plant it over there? So she didn't let me sit down. So whenever she would move, I would act like I'm doing something every time. So now I live in my own house. I sit down. No, one, no one's going to tell me to do shit. I sold the business. I don't have to worry about any company. And I have to worry about money. And that's when it all hit me at once. Holy shit. Boom. Yeah. You're in shock. And I was like, damn, this is fucking crazy. I was like, <laughs> like I can't believe it. Was there something that you were like, I have yeah, all I this like, money? Yeah, I was like, I'm going to France. <laughs> that's, that's what you did? I'm going like, to Let's France? Let's go to France. Boom. You spent a ton of money in France? Yeah, it's like my friends were there. I'm like, I don't give a shit about spending money. I'm not like, I just, you're, you're there, do this company. Oh, let, let's do France. Suffer France. Let's go. I think it was Cannes or something. Let's go. Complete freedom. Freedom. I can go wherever. Oh, no, 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 no. Mykonos, what am I talking? I went to Mykonos. That's what I did. A year later, I went to France. But I'm like, I can do it fucking forever. This is crazy. You can do whatever the fuck you want. Yeah, yeah. At that point, it's like almost like money's not real. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things that, I mean, the interest on your money grows into a point that you can, as much as you're going to spend and go, and it's it like it didn't even look at your account. It just keeps going up with the interest. That's like, crazy. This is fucking crazy. So it, it gives you like, it gives you a little problematic problem because you're saying look at, at before if i wanted to think of my next business every time i think of my next business i tell myself but how is it going to compare with what i'm making right now from doing nothing so it's, a, <laughs> it's also a challenge you know right like whatever i do i gotta be fucking bigger than the other ones I yeah i'm not doing it again that's it but but at the same time you don't want to retire right because you're, no 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 no. i have two companies now now I, you have two companies yeah i, I do two okay. companies it took me a minute but but I, to find the what like yeah. I said, it takes a minute what are the two companies now if they're if that's yes, public sure. information so, uh no I, I can tell you so one um i started doing a lot of options trading after i I sold my business. Oh, really? I figured I got to learn how to play. I need to understand financial market and all that. So my friend is a day trader. He does options every day. He told me, come, come, come. I said, crazy options? I don't know anything about it, but I heard you lose everything. He said, no, no, I have a strategy. You don't. He showed it to me. I started playing. I put like a thousand bucks here, a thousand bucks there. Then I started putting more and more and more. Eventually, it got to like... Tens of millions that I was playing and I always Holy won. Holy shit. But then around, I want to say November 2021, December 2021, I'm like, that's it, I'm done. I did amazing, but I had, it was, I didn't have the stomach for it. It was too fucking stressful and I'm like, it's pointless living in stress like this. It's addicting and I live in stress. I, yeah. I'm getting out of it. But everything I do, I could have had a but doing it way more effective, way more efficient. So I called my best friend. He's uh, specialized in algorithm. He's, he has a master in, uh, uh, he's electrical engineer. And um, he came in with another friend of ours that is also a partner. He has a PhD in physics and post PhD in physics. They both specialize in algos for a big cell phone company. 
and um, for over 10 years and I told them let's build an actual tool because the future will be AI, the next bubble will be AI. I told them that early 2022. Uh, I'm like, guys, this is what I did with options trading. We need a batch. Like, oh, we can put this on zeros and ones and it's going to be way better, just like with chess and all that stuff. We decided uh, to go with this. Another friend of mine had the same exact idea. He was always, he was doing what I was doing without coordinating it with me. And we decided to just merge our companies together. So now we have a bot that it does crazy money. You sell the bot or how does the business work? Right now we're just making money with the bot, but we are because it's, uh, we got already from private equities, everybody. It's, uh, so we put a package behind this and we're going to start selling it. The name wow. is uh, Corvado and uh, with a T. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it does, it does great. It, it just consistently make money it's just a great two strategies that goes yeah. in and i don't want to break it down obviously i can't yeah, yeah but um i think the point the point is that because i came from a business that started like a mom and pop small business and turned into an enterprise i was able to use some of that mindset well like, when is the right time to put enterprise infrastructure for something small that doesn't take too much and would still allow you to stay nimble and fast and that's what we did. So in terms of tech stack, everything is there. We build uh, the, the the part of the strategies is built. Then there is the offline tool, which is the actual intelligent to improve parameters and so on. Mm -hmm. um, use different strategies for that. I can go on and on on this because yeah. it is a fascinating part. And like anything else, you start learning the details of something you didn't know before. So that's one business. What uh, is your plan to sell that one as well? Or well. Everything is on the table, right? Uh, I can yeah. tell you that this month we did 20% in profit. Now everyone, wow. now I have friends that are in, in the hedge fund world and uh, the, some of them are quant hedge funds, similar to what we're doing. The first answer is it's impossible. Well, you can go ahead and check it on uh, my FX book and uh, which is a third party that can check all the numbers. You can fake it, you can check it anywhere you want. They do, and then they come like, okay, can we put money and can we work on stuff together? So now we're working on that one uh, and also selling it to re retail consumer. We're probably going to launch it uh, in the next few weeks or something. Oh, amazing. Yeah. So that the average investor can throw some money in. And yeah, anyone will be able to put money in. and you know. Credit investors probably. Gonna I mean, to... we're probably going to look at this as a software. But okay. We might sell it as a software. Got it. It's, as a, it's, a, it's a fintech. Uh, because we're not regulated to manage anyone's money, so Got it. but we can give you a software and you can just plug it in and it can start running for you. Wow, I think, yeah. that's amazing. What's the other company? So the other company is in the healthcare space. I looked into peptides. We did mention that before, um, in not not in the podcast, but before. But um, I wanted to get into peptides. It went through a little bit of struggle the whole space, but eventually we decided to go after the GLP one, uh, which is the compounding version of Ozempic and Manjero. Okay. So Ozempic and Manjero are the number one. There are two medications that are sold more than any other medication in the world in the human history. Wow. What is the second one? Onjero? Manjero. So Manjero is, is, is superior. It's, uh, so it's the better version of Ozempic. Uh, okay. So the GLP-1, if you look at uh, Ozempic, it's the first time that we're able to hit uh, one receptor that actually helps you lose weight. And the first receptor, which... Uh, uh, it does is um, it basically slows down your digestive system that it signals your brain that you're full. Got it. Uh, so that is Ozempic. Got it. Manjero hits two receptors. It hits that receptor the same exact way, but it has another one which basically makes you more insulin sensitive. So it helps. It doesn't let you retain uh, sugar. It, your, your blood level, your glucose in the blood goes down. Got it. Which is obviously helping you. But it, it has more benefit than just losing weight, actually. Mm -hmm. it, it helps you also live longer for that reason. It helps many other cases. So mm -hmm. you're allowed to compound it and sell it as well. Uh, so I went all the way. I don't understand this space. All the competitors we have in that space, none of them ever went and figured, how can I control the supply chain in order to beat everybody. In my old space, I understood economics is a key. In this case, I cannot put a superior product. I can put the same product. It's a medication. I can only put a superior price. Mm -hmm. So in order to do it, I can just go to a compounding pharmacy. I need to own one. 
Second, I need to buy directly, not from a distributor. I need to buy the molecule directly from the source, the provider. So you have to travel the world and you have to find them. And we got everything. So once we get it, launch it, if it costs about $300 a month, we'll be able to cut the cost by a lot. Kind of like Elon Musk goes to uh, space and bring back the rocket. Yeah. And now everything is cheaper, same thing. Got it. Uh, so that's one of them. But there are a lot more in the barrel, and there are other molecules in the barrel, but that's, uh, that's the second part. So you're combining the Ozempic and the other one? And, well, we'll no, sell like, it whatever they want. Got right? it. It's, uh, people want one or the other, we'll provide. But, um, Do you take that yourself now? I don't, actually. I don't. The, um, the trisepatite, I actually got a pretty high cholesterol, even though you see me fit. I'm not sure if it's because I did... Uh, I did increase my cholesterol maybe because of my diet or maybe because I was taking some growth hormone peptides that are known for that. Uh, so I'm going to start taking trisepatite to lower the cholesterol, but it's Got different it. dosage. Got it. And then the one that helps you lose weight. And, and is that your passion now? You think it's the health and fitness side? No, I, I didn't. I, no, I mean, I enjoy it's, it. Right. I enjoy working out, but not all the time. Tell me, do you like every day to work out when you work out? No, of course yeah. not. This is where the discipline comes in. Yeah. On the days you need it, yeah, like, I don't want to do it, but the discipline comes in, kicks off. You do it one or two sets and then the energy starts coming. More blood is pumped into the muscle and you feel more energetic to work out. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't always do it. I just feel like I need to find a what. If you, if you look right. at why would I open a business like this? Because that's where I found the opportunity, right? And then everything looks like an opportunity for that eventually. It's kind of like when you look, my house was uh, belonged to, well, a piece of it, uh, was belonged to um, Wayne Heisinger. So he's... Uh, Who's that? Wayne Heisinger is a multi-billionaire known in Fort Lauderdale, and he's the founder of Waste Management. Okay. I made Waste Management. Last time I checked their ticker price, their, uh, their market cap was over $200 billion. Wow. They pick up all the garbage all over the country, right? Yeah. Do you think his passion was to pick up garbage? Right. Right. It was to go and make money, and yeah. he saw the opportunity in garbage collecting. Yeah. And that's the uh, same thing. Of course. Yeah. What, what are some of your passions and hobbies? Now, because you really building don't businesses. have businesses. That's what it is. Yeah, it's building. being an entrepreneur. Yeah. Being bu building businesses, like just. I was. I was. Ha I had a lot of passion. A lot. A lot of hobbies yeah. before I had my first business, and yeah. I literally traded mentally to the business. I yeah. lost all the passion. I lost the passion for my, I mean, I still like to dance salsa and listen to it, but I dance salsa once a year. Yeah. Right. But before I started my company, I was my first one. I was always salsa dancing. <laughs> Great way to pick up I girls just, um, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that, that's true. But, but now yeah. building companies, doing some fun stuff like this. this nice. Is my passion, yeah. And did you grow up around entrepreneurs? Were your parents entrepreneurs, your friends? Or were you kind of the trailblazer? Well, definitely. My mom, I mean, how do you call that? My mom was a hairdresser uh, working from home. So I guess it's an entrepreneur, but do you really call it an entrepreneur? Right. I don't know where, <laughs> where do you put that. <laughs> right. You know, so my dad was, I wasn't, I never really lived with my dad, so it doesn't really. Uh, so I guess it's more of a trailblazer. Mm -hmm. And how, mm -hmm. like, do you have siblings? I don't know. You don't have siblings. Okay, so how have the friends you've grown up with, like, do you still stay in touch with them? Oh, man. Yeah. How, how, how have those relate? Like, how does life this, change? This, this is the beauty of it. So yeah. my friend, my best friend since I was this big, I was in second grade. He's my partner in my awesome. quant company. Nice. And uh, his brother was working for me for a boxy charm. And he was working with him, too. Um, I have a lot of friends from high school, from just from my past. I, just on my high school friends, we have a WhatsApp group with, I think it's about 200 of us. Wow. From high school, yeah. Yeah. So wherever I, whenever I go to Israel, I always see high school friends. I always, I mean, we travel together to concerts globally. And oh, amazing. So you still concerts. stay connected with all oh, friends. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No jealousy, no... All the uh, stories about don't talk to anybody and all that stuff, I mean, it really, it's not apply all. I don't know right. if your friends are all criminals that drive you down and convince no, you to no, do no, drugs no. right right but if they're not like i don't need them to all be business people of course i mean some of them are brilliant in their own domain and yeah yeah it's like yeah so and plus it's it's not bad to once a while disconnect yourself and just go back to friends that you had in the past and right. just enjoy with them and 
And there's nothing wrong with that. Are there certain people, on the other hand, that you've become close friends with as a result that you never thought would be in your inner circle? Like, so, mm, from my past past, yes. Um, not I didn't think about it. So we had a high school reunion, yeah. and that's how the WhatsApp group came, back, came to life. And through that... I have friends that, you know, we knew each other, but yeah, yeah. we weren't friends in high school. Right. And now we became really good friends. Yeah. Um, Are there any, like, public like, figures or celebrities? Oh, that, yeah, that of course. Sense? I never thought I'm going to be in touch. I mean, I've been, uh, you know, in touch with the Kardashians many times when I was working with them. I never thought I'll be in their home. And it's like, I, just, I never thought that. You yeah. Know, it really gets you places. And, uh, uh more than once you meet with them you talk to them more than once they they see you they recognize you hey what's going on it's like what it's like how the hell i'm just a schmuck coming from there right? yeah yeah so it's fun yeah that's awesome that's great and also you get to see the human side of the people behind the screen yeah and it's, it's just nice because i mean you know they're saying you should never meet your heroes not to say that i don't have heroes right yeah but you meet people that you know, celebrities and so on, and you know, sometimes they're fucking awesome people. Right. And you're just like, shit, like, I love them. It's, it's yeah. Awesome. And, and I've, like, living in Miami, I meet a ton of celebrities, a ton yeah. of people that are, you know, influencers. Now more than before, yeah. right? Now, yeah, Since now more than ever. Since the renaissance we've busted. Yes, that, yeah. 100%. Yeah. And you realize that most of them are just average people, you know? 100%. As long as, yeah. as, long as you treat them as kind of average people and you're not kissing them. Don't act weird next right. to them, like a group or something. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So just let's finish off the podcast. What are some like? What's the number one tip you'd have someone you'd have for a young business owner that wants to take their business Stay to focused. the next? Level? That's Stay it. Focus on what's important and urgent. And while you're asking yourself why is my competitor doing better, ask themselves what are they doing during the day that I'm not. Where am I wasting my time on? What? Because I bet you there's things you're doing that you should not do. It's it, you. It's the problem starts with things that are important, just not important enough. Because hmm. if it's completely not important, most likely people know it's not important to deal with this. Yeah. But when there is some importance, not too much, you, you might spend 80% of your day on things that are somewhat important instead of kill all that and say, focus on what's absolutely important and urgent. Start with the urgent and then go to the super important. Then if you have some more time, do everything else. That's that's going to get you far further in life. Amazing. Thank you. No Thank you for your time. That was awesome. All right. All right we crushed it.